Irving Kristol was not entirely sold by traditionalism. He liked traditionalism's emphasis on religion, its focus on the family, its, its the primacy of virtue, but he also thought that traditionalism could easily lead into a utopianism of its own. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Nate and Johnny. Marlo is out today, and we're joined by Matt Continetti, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where his work is focused on American political thought and history, and the founding editor and editor-in-chief of the Washington Free Beacon. Before that, he was opinion editor at the Weekly Standard. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thanks for having me. Before we get started with our interview, I'd like to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you'd like to help us in pursuing that mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Matt, uh, many of our listeners are familiar with your work and your writing for National Review, but for those of you who don't know you personally, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your education, background, and specifically how ISI played a role in your life uh, when it comes to journalism. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, thank you to ISI, I should say. I, I grew up in Northern Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. My parents were not political. My father sold cars as part of the uh, family business, which my immigrant great-grandfather had started in the 1920s. And my mother was a public school teacher. But being around, in D around the D.C. area, politics is kind of always there. I used to skip class in high school and visit the S Congress while it was in session. In fact, a piece of cons uh, Republican and conservative history, through my Cub Scout troop, I get got to know uh, Representative Bob Dornan, B2 Bob, as he was called, the uh, Orange County Republican who was an arch conservative and one of my favorites. And uh, Bob Dornan actually took my Cub Scout troop when I was in elementary school up to the, the very top, the very top of the U.S. Capitol. And uh, I think maybe that was one of the moments where I said, this is, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to follow is American politics. And to this day, the Capitol remains my favorite building in the world. But I went to uh, Columbia University, uh, not really planning on being a journalist, but being a historian or a teacher or a creative writer. And I pretty quickly f figured out that uh, I, I wouldn't be able to live in McLean, Virginia, like I do now if I was a creative writer. So I turned to journalism. And around this time, too, John, I was um, not really a conservative. Um, I, I uh, was not really familiar even with the various political standpoints. I had just kind of had my own middle of the road politics, I suppose. But beginning in my Columbia uh, core curriculum classes, which forced me to read uh, Plato's Republic, Aristotle's Ethics and Politics, the Federalist Papers, Hobbes, Locke, Smith, Burke, by the end of my sophomore year in college, uh, thanks to Columbia, which is not known for its conservatism, I was definitely on the philosophical right. And then 9-11 happened at the beginning of my junior year while I was in New York, while I was in charge of, in fact, actually uh, about 35 first years as a, a resident advisor. And that definitely kind of uh, sealed the deal for me uh, in terms of the conservative worldview and in terms of a conservative foreign policy of peace through strength. Now, and at, at that time, just to bring ISI back into the picture, ISI had a physical print magazine campus magazine and the other conservative on the Columbia campus there was just only one and then he graduated leaving me but the other conservative on the conservative uh, on the Columbia campus recommended I start writing for campus magazine and that put me in touch with ISI which led to a relationship to uh, with the uh, collegiate network collegiate network led to an internship at National Review then a year-long fellowship at the weekly standard magazine after I graduated from college in 2003. And here I am 20 years later, still doing what I've, what I was, what I've been uh, trained to do and 
uh, following American politics and commenting and analyzing it from a conservative perspective. And uh, picking up on that last note, uh, Matt, you have a new book that's out this April called The Right, The Hundred Year War for American Conservatism. I, I mean, in general, I just would, I think our listeners would love to hear what the book is about. But I think that the specific thing that I'm interested in is there's been any number of books sort of just from a sort of political theory, political thought perspective about what conservatism means in recent years, because it's, I think, more uncertain now than it has been in a while. But I think one of the really important things about your book is that it is a historical account um, of conservatism. So rather than just sort of discussing conservative political philosophy, it's actually trying to put this particular moment in terms of the sort of internecine debates about conservatism in a historical context. Um, so I'd love to hear why you think, I mean, in general, I think the listeners would like to hear what you what the book is essentially about and what it's trying to do, but also why you think that it was important to write the book in this particular moment. Sure. Thanks, Nate. So uh, on April 19th, my book, The Right, The Hundred Year War for American Conservatism will be published. It's a, a big book. It's uh, 406 pages long of text. Don't let it frighten you. There is an audio version, uh, which will be available uh, on publication. And uh, you, of course, can pre-order the book on Amazon. Um, I believe there are copies already floating around the ISI headquarters and uh, uh, Nate Hockman headquarters, wherever that may be. Um, why did I write the book? Well, <clears throat> so I talked a little bit about my career trajectory. And over my years in Washington, I became more and more familiar with the fact that conservatism is not one thing. It is, in fact, several competing things. And there are various factions of American conservatives today. But there are also have been many, many other types of conservatives in the American past. And so I wanted to tell the story of how we arrived at the present moment by going back in many ways at the beginning. But in a certain uh, uh, perspective, which is most stories of American conservatism from both the right and the left begin when conservatism took form as a self-conscious movement, a political movement, whose goal was to shape the Republican Party in a conservative direction. And that, that period was right after the Second World War. I thought it would, we'd better understand the American right today if we began before the war, if in fact we began in the 1920s, when there really wasn't a self-conscious American conservatism what we think of conservatism was really just normal and what the, what, what the way things were. And so the book tell, begins with uh, Warren Harding's inauguration in March of 1921, and, and it ends with Joe Biden's inauguration in uh, January of 2021. And it tells the whole story there. And just to give you a taste, one of my themes in this book is the, the, the ceaseless competition and occasional collaboration between an elite-driven conservatism, which is built on institutions and ideas, and a populist conservatism, which is driven from below by grassroots voters responding to a liberal provocation. And those two elements have always been present in this history, but they they often find themselves in conflict. And I think uh, that's that conflict helps shed light on what has happened to the right over the last, uh, say, six, uh, six, seven years. It's interesting, Matt, something you said about the fact that before there's a self-conscious movement conservatism, there almost wasn't, um, it, it wasn't necessary to have a sort of self-conscious right because all politics were sort of implicitly conservative. So, I mean, I think obvi it's obvious that movement conservatism was a response to the, the progressive era to a certain extent, right? To the New Deal, to the sort of uh, subsequent progressive reforms. And, and, and prior to the progressive era, the sort of right and left spectrum in America um, looked, looked very, very different than it does now. But I think there's also been a lot of discussion in recent years about the new trends in the right sort of reaching backwards to a pre-1950s version of right-wing politics in America. Um, what do you make of, of the... The, 
sort of the argument that a lot of what we're seeing, the sort of resurgent strains of conservative thought today are pre-movement conservative versions of right-wing thought. Um, and if you do think that there's something to that, what are the fundamental differences between the modern sort of right-wing innovations and the, the ones that we saw that were sort of dominant at the, the beginning of the 20th century? I'm very um, taken by a concept that the uh, George Washington University professor Alan Lichtman introduced in his uh, history of conservatism, which in many ways I, I differ from. But he had this concept uh, called um, engaged nationalism to describe the foreign policy of conservatives after World War II, which is that their nationalism felt ne necessary to be engaged in the world, to support <clears throat> the forward deployment of American forces to support alliances such as NATO, uh, to support a, a relatively open system of trade, um, to uh, encourage the growth of the economies of our allies so that they did not go into the Soviet sphere of influence. And this engaged nationalism was premised on the overwhelming threat of the Soviet Union. And the fact that anti-communism was really the glue in many ways that bound together all the various factions of conservatism that I alluded to a few minutes ago. So the Soviet Union collapses in 1991 that no longer exists, right? And with it went the glue of anti-communism. And with it went the sense of threat, the fear of communism that had led many conservatives and Republicans to believe in the foreign policy of engaged nationalism. So in recent years, I think we've seen a return to the pre-World War II for foreign policies of the right, which was a policy of what Lichtman calls disengaged nationalism. It is still nationalistic. It still believes in American strength. In many ways, it still believes in American exceptionalism. But it also believes that America's freedom of action is significantly reduced if we are bound by alliances and security guarantees. It also believes that uh, protective walls are necessary to insulate America from the gales of creative destruction that emanate from the global economy. It also believes, as Republicans in the 1920s did, uh, that uh, immigration should be seriously reduced, if not almost ab abolished, um, uh, for uh, for not, not so good reasons, in my view, but also for economic reasons that would, would uh, that would help create tight labor markets within the United States and thus boost wages. So I think you're right to suggest that, <clears throat> in many respects. Uh, the, there are parts of the emerging right uh, that are very reminiscent of uh, the right prior to World War II. Now, I will say, though, um, it, this trend has been complicated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And even while at the intellectual level, the arguments of disengaged nationalism con continue, at the political level, when we actually look at the behavior of conservative aligned Republican elected officials, and when we look at the public opinion data, um, there is, I think, uh, a resurgence of um, uh, engaged nationalism, a sense that, no, we should do more, uh, more than what the Biden administration has done and is doing to make sure Russia loses the war in Ukraine. So that's the asterisk. And I'm, I'm watching to see whether the intellectual arguments, which are still being made for disengaged nationalism, for saying that Ukraine is not our fight, for saying that NATO is still, it has become, is irrelevant or even um, uh, harms American interests by backing Russia into this corner. I'm waiting to see whether those arguments percolate to the to the actual Republican elected officials and their voters, Matt, I'm I'm interested in diving you know a little more into the the Ukraine question, perhaps a little later on in the episode. I'm wondering if you could comment on some of those pre World War II kind of old right conservative intellectuals, the Albert J. Knox of the world, 
the Robert Tafts. Maybe there's some other, um, you know, there's some other figures that a lot of, especially young conservatives, just aren't familiar with that were really there at the the beginnings. So I'm wondering if you could talk about a, a few of them and maybe recommend some some books that our students might be interested in reading. Sure. Well, let me start with the politicians. People ask me, you know, well, who who do you spend time on that resp- kind of surprised you? Or, and I say, uh, at least for the pre-war period, the person I talk about the most that I wasn't expecting to talk about a lot was Robert Taft. Uh, I found him absolutely fascinating. He was, of course, the son of a president. He uh, was an Ohio lawyer who had his eye on the presidency as early as 1936, before even he had been elected to the Senate. He wasn't elected to the Senate until 1938. Um, But someone who uh, believed in this policy of disengaged nationalism. Why did he believe it? Well, uh, one of uh, Robert Taft's early jobs was accompanying um, Herbert Hoover, who at in, in the aftermath of the Great War, World War I, was put in charge of America's uh, contributions to the relief and reconstruction effort. And Taft's experience with Hoover in Europe after World War I made him believe that there was no more destructive force than war. That war should be avoided at almost every cost. And also that Europe was a, a jungle uh, uh, that could easily entangle the United States in its centuries of ethnic and political conflict. And so we should be very wary of getting involved in, um, in European politics at all. And, and that was Robert Taft. And that, and that led him, of course, even after the war uh, to, um, to oppose the, cre- the, the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the NATO alliance. But a uh, fascinating guy. Uh, at the intellectual level, Right, you mentioned uh, Albert J. Nock, uh, the um, uh, the kind of bohemian journalist. Uh, he, in fact, was a, a minister, Nock, uh, who abandoned his family to go to Greenwich Village and start writing for publications um, such as the the first version of the Freeman, which he founded and edited, but also for the American Mercury magazine, which was edited by the most famous journalist of the age, H.L. Mencken. And Nock and Mencken really represented an early form of elite libertarianism, as I guess the way I would call it, um, anti-statist, but uh, also very much uh, anti-interventionist, but also anti-populist in a weird way. You know, they looked, both Nock and Mencken looked down on the American public. Uh, You know, Mencken famously called uh, most Americans uh, the bourgeoisie, right? Uh, They're kind of idiots in the view of Nock and Mencken. They didn't really deserve a lot of the benefits uh, that were handed down to them, such as, say, education. Nock did not believe that most people could be educated. So Nock and Mencken had a very aristocratic view of politics um, and uh, this also often led them to criticize the Republican politicians of the time. But the Republican politicians of the time, I should say, by any measure, were very conservative. Uh, and uh, even though they were these types of disengaged nationalists, when you look at their reverence for the Constitution, when you look at their support for the free enterprise system, um, when you look at, um, in fact, their attempts despite a lot of opposition, to um, make real the promise of emancipation for black Americans. Uh, Warren Harding, uh, who is often, you know, despised as kind of this corrupt uh, figure, and uh, then his successor, Calvin Coolidge, I think in many ways are models for American conservatives. You know, it struck me, Tom Cotton, the senator from Arkansas, recently gave a speech at the Reagan uh, uh, Library in California, where he noted that Reagan had uh, the Democratic president, Andrew Jackson's portrait in the Oval Office, uh, at least for some portion of the Reagan presidency. But well, what he left out is the other portrait he made sure hung from the Oval Office was the portrait of Calvin Coolidge. And you know, Reagan, who had bo- was born in 1911, remembered the Coolidge presidency. And so he kind of imbibed that philosophy of what I call Calvinism, and uh, and brought it back to Washington. 
decades, decades later. So I talk about Harding, I talk about Coolidge, I talk about Taft, and then I get into Nock and Mencken. And one just last note on Nock. Nock was a very brilliant writer. Some of his essays deeply influenced the post-war conservative movement. Uh, one of his essay collections is called Our, Our Enemy, the State. And it is, it is just a remarkably um, libertarian um, uh, theoretical text, uh, extremely anti-statist, had a huge impact on a lot of young right-wing intellectuals. Um, another essay he wrote was something called Isaiah's Job. And it was first published in the Atlantic Monthly in the 1936. And then it was um, republished in essay collections later. And this was this idea that um, conservatives or like-minded people uh, such as Nock would never be able to um, win over the public. The best they could do is just speak their mind and hope that the, like, you know, the few um, similarly enlightened individuals, what Nock called the remnant, would listen and keep alive the tradition uh, through the centuries. Um, and then finally, he wrote a, a, a book I recommend to everyone called Memoirs of a Superfluous Man. This was toward the end of his life. Both he and Mencken, it's interesting, um, during the New Deal era, which they vehemently opposed, and then during the, the World War II era and the lead up to World War II, which they both opposed, turned to biography. So Mencken's autobiographical, uh, autobiographical trilogy was written at that point, and Knox, a Memoirs of a Superfluous Man, was written at that point. And the title, in a way, says it all, because it, it's about how his type of elitist, aristocratic character who uh, is cultured and who considers himself the carrier of the greatest elements of Western civilization is superfluous in the mass democracy, the, the huge industrial economy uh, of the um, first half of the 20th century. And that book in particular uh, was read by figures uh, that uh, I also talk at length about in my book, such as Russell Kirk, such as Robert Nisbet, and of course, uh, such as William F. Buckley Jr., and in my view, the founder of uh, post-war American conservatism, who, whose father was close friends with Albert J. Nock, and who invited uh, Nock to the Buckley um, estate in Sharon, Connecticut, while Buckley was still uh, growing up. And so that, that elitist view of conservatism and also that anti-statist view of American conser conservatism had a great impact on the young Buckley. Matt, you mentioned um, Tom Cotton earlier, and he's a particularly interesting figure to me in all of this because he's sort of a mix of engaged and, and disengaged nationalism. On the one hand, he's probably one of the most hawkish people in the Senate. But on the other hand, he's quite restrictionist on immigration. I don't know exactly where he is on trade, but he's quite sort of populist domestically in general. I don't think he's, he's certainly not the sort of 1990s post Reagan sort of open society conservative. I think um, he represents a slightly different strain on of, of conservative thought on domestic policy while also maintaining a hawkish line um, on foreign policy. And in the discussions of engaged versus disengaged nationalism, I looking at what's happening in Ukraine, as you pointed out, and this resurgence of a sort of hawkish sentiment on the right, while also looking at the sort of populist developments in the way that, that the conservatives think about issues like immigration and trade in recent years, I wouldn't be surprised if the sort of mix that someone like Cotton represents actually points to the most viable way forward for um, American conservatism. And I think it's, I'm curious what you think of that, but I'm also curious about the, uh, the distinction between what I see as two different kinds of disengaged nationalism or engaged nationalism, which is that you have a sort of idealist sort of Bush, second term Bush, sort of nation building kind of engaged nationalism. Um, and then you have what I think Cotton represents, which is less interested in sort of this sort of idealist, the future of, of ev every man is liberty and democracy and more just a... a more sort of realist engagement with the world in the interest of American interests rather than in the interest of spreading universal democracy and liberty. So I'm curious what you think of, th that was a lot of questions packed in there. There's a lot there. Mm -hmm. 
let me try to tackle it from a few perspectives. What is Tom Cotton trying to do? Tom Cotton, the senator from Arkansas, I think uh, he's a friend of mine. I think he's uh, one of the most impressive figures in the modern Republican Party. And he's also a very, very intelligent man. Tom Cotton is trying to synthesize the Trump wing of the party with elements, the remnant, so to speak, of the pre-Trump party. And so this text in the Reagan library is fascinating because uh, it shows how he is, is advocating for not just himself, but other Republicans to attempt the synthesis. As you say, on foreign policy, uh, he harkens back to this Goldwater Reagan idea of peace through strength. But uh, it's it, and like Goldwater and Reagan, it is engaged nationalism. It's it is America has a role to play in the world. However, Tom Cotton is an opponent of illegal immigration. He says in the speech, the appropriate level of illegal immigration is zero. And then he is also an opponent uh, of the current system of legal immigration, which he wants to transform into a skills-based system of immigration, like they have in Canada or Australia. On trade, this is the most uh, protectionist he's been, I think. In the speech, uh, he advocates for serious reforms to begin what is called the strategic decoupling of the American economy from the Chinese economy, reduced our dependence on the Chinese economy, uh, which also gives China leverage if, say, the United States and China should come to blows over Taiwan. So you're right. On immigration and trade, he is more of a pre-war, pre-World War II conservative. And on foreign policy, he is more of a post-World War II conservative. Who is Tom Cotton's constituency? I mentioned that he talked a lot about Andrew Jackson. Now, this is very curious. Andrew Jackson was the founder of the Democratic Party. And yet here Tom Cotton is talking about the future of the Republican Party. And so what Tom Cotton is responding to is one of the biggest developments in American politics during the past 60 years which is that the base of the Democratic Party, we call them the white working class. Better way maybe to describe these voters are white Americans without college degrees, many of whom are wealthy. So it's just better to just talk about their education attainment. These voters, white voters without college degrees, have migrated from the Democratic Party where they form the base to the Republican Party, and so that they are now the base, the most largest constituency, voting constituency of the Republican Party. And another name for many of these voters, not all of them, but many of them, is Jacksonian. Now, uh, the Wall Street Journal columnist Walter Russell Mead wrote a book, which I recommend to everyone, called Special Providence. It's a history of American foreign policy. He divides American foreign policy into four schools. The innovation of this book is he talks about Jacksonian foreign policy. What are the Jacksonians? Who are they? And Walter Russell Mead, who's from the South, knows them. He grew up with them. The Jacksonians uh, subscribe to an honor code. They exemplify this idea, which you may have heard, of, you know, no better friend, no worse enemy, right? And that is their foreign policy. That's the Jacksonian foreign policy. Not for preemptive war, not for uh, necessarily a project to turn the world into a commonwealth of democracies. But if America is attacked, or if our sense of honor is outraged, America will hit back and will not really care about the means America uses to accomplish the job. So the previous president, 
President Trump, I think, was Jacksonianism in action. And the example I gave is his uh, raid that killed uh, Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Iranian Revolution Guard Corps, right? Uh, or Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Iranian militia, basically, which causes such havoc throughout the Middle East. We're recording this a few days after the Iranians launched an attack on Erbil, Iraq, in the north, which some of the rockets landed on our consulate, the United States consulate there. Well, a few years ago, uh, in, in 2019, similar rocket attacks were being launched by Iranian-backed militias within Iraq on American forces. To stop this, what did Trump do? Did he ask for permission? Did he telegraph his plans? Did he say what he wasn't going to do? No. He killed he killed the head of the organization. And Iran had a brief response, which was minimal to impact, though, of course, costly in some ways. But that was it. That's Jacksonianism. And that's the foreign policy that Tom Cotton is trying to uh, theorize right, about but also urge the Republican Party to move more closely toward. Matt, I'm wondering if you can, in light of that kind of the synthesis that you mentioned, uh, the Tom Tom Cotton, you know, being more hawkish, more Jacksonian on foreign policy, more engaged domestic policy, you know, is probably more comfortable with with certain restrictions on markets for the sake of the American citizen, the, holding together the American nation. I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit about the origins of neoconservatism and perhaps, uh, you know, talk about how some of the, you know, even critiques of capitalism that you might see with Irving Kristol's Two Chairs for Capitalism, we're starting to see some of those, you know, emerge on the new right. Maybe you could even say cotton might be influenced by some of that thinking. So could you talk a little bit about the, the origins of neoconservatism and its relevance for our current moment? Thank you. I'd be happy to. It's my favorite subject. People don't understand what neoconservatism is. People assume that George W. Bush was a neoconservative. People think that neoconservatism is a foreign policy doctrine. It came to be that. There are different types of neoconservatives, just as there are different types of conservatives. This is why everyone needs to read my book. The original neoconservatives were a group of ex-radicals they had been on the radical left in their 20s. But by middle age, they were anti-communist liberals. They were liberal Democrats who nonetheless believed in a policy of, of containment against the Soviet Union. And they opposed communism at home as well. Um, they were anti-communist liberals. But they started recoiling from developments on their campuses. Many of them are professors. When the anti-war movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and the Black Power movement began leading to serious disruptions in our cities and in our schools. And it made them wonder what the causes of that disruption was. And it also made them look more skeptically on the government programs that many of them had championed. And so a figure like Irving Kristol, who uh, was an anti-communist liberal, did not vote for a Republican until 1972. Irving was born in 1920, so he was 52 years old when he voted for his first Republican. He had a great BS detector, Irving Kristol. And here he is in the 1960s, living through LBJ's Great Society, and he's seeing all this chaos and he, at home, and he's wondering, well, what, what is happening? Are LBJ's policies actually leading to LBJ's desired results, or are they making everything worse? And so he and another anti-communist liberal, his friend Daniel Bell, a sociologist at Harvard, formed a magazine called the Public Interest Magazine. The Public Interest Magazine was explicitly devoted to analysis of domestic policy, 
They say Irving and Daniel Bell knew that if they introduced foreign policy into the magazine, it would just be incoherent because everyone had different opinions about the Vietnam War. So they were just looked at domestic policy. And they used social science techniques to measure whether the government programs that many of them had supported actually were achieving their goals. And guess what? They weren't. And in many cases, these government programs were making everything worse. So they began moving to the right. At the same time, Irving Kristol had a very independent intellect. He was not ready to uh, just sign on to the types of um, conservatism that were on offer. Let's break it down to libertarianism and traditionalism. He liked libertarianism's focus on economic growth. He thought its focus on freedom was important, free society. But he also thought that it was too um, abstract, that most people were not doctrinaire libertarians, and that it was too aligned with the interests of the business community, which Irving Kristol, who grew up during the Great Society, always had a certain suspicion toward. On the other hand, Irving Kristol was not entirely sold by traditionalism. So he liked tra traditionalism's emphasis on religion, its focus on the family, its, its the primacy of virtue. But he also thought that traditionalism could easily lead into a utopianism of its own, a certain capital R romantic attitude toward the past that was both unrealistic and did not off that uh, gesture to our past that did not include people like Irving Kristol, who was Jewish. So how do we figure out our way between these two poles, libertarianism or traditionalism? And what Irving Kristol, his synthesis was that we should think about it this way. We should like economic freedom for its growth, for its individual liberty, but we should also understand that markets cannot tell us how to live. We need traditionalism to give our lives meaning. We need the institutions that traditionalists work, work on, religion, the family, to form us and to direct our lives and to provide those satisfactions. So you had to look through the lens of both and figure out where they met. But I will say this, yes, that led to a more you know, skeptical attitude toward a lot of market arguments. And some of his greatest essays, Irving Kristol's, are critiques of the economics of Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman, the foremost libertarian thinkers. However, and this is important to remember, Irving Kristol supported liberal democracy, even if he was critical of it. He also knew that a system of individual rights and a system of religious freedom was necessary and was the only system that provided space for intellects such as his. So I, I think on some level, there are similarities between what I call first wave neoconservatism and some of the economic arguments that are being made today that are, that are a little bit skeptical about markets. But when you go deeper in some of the arguments being made and their attitude toward classical liberalism as a philosophy, liberal democracy as a, as a, as a fact, uh, he would not go. He would not go there. He would say there are obviously problems with liberal democracy. There are philosophical issues with classical liberalism, but there are issues and problems with every system and it's wrong to assume that uh that those problems don't exist in your in your favored preferential uh, political ideal i'm curious matt what you think of the argument that the sort of there's a lot of intellectual energy flying around on the right right now and i think some of it's more useful than um than other than other forms and the versions of the whatever you want to call it the new right the nationalist populist movement that wants to throw out liberal democracy altogether is obviously at odds with a lot of what Crystal is writing and talking about. It seems like the best version of that project, the best interpretation, the best thinkers from that movement are 
in many ways talking about a lot of what what Crystal was talking about, particularly in terms of uh, something that you've written a little bit about before, which is Crystal's idea of the conservative welfare state and the idea that the the welfare state conservatives need to declare peace on the welfare state and uh, some some form of welfare state is actually compatible with conservative politics, right? That sort of critique of a version of sort of free market libertarian capitalist conservative thinking that Crystal was making is one that you hear a lot from folks like Orrin Cass in American Compass um, and people in that sort of strain of conservative economic thinking today. What do you think of that new intellectual energy on the right in terms of its relationship to what Crystal was talking about? Um, and do you think it really is reminiscent of that? Or do you think it's it's going a completely different direction and it's departing from a lot of what Crystal was defending? Nate, you ask such large questions. <laughs> try to try to get some in there. I know we're running on time. Mm -hmm. The conservative welfare state. Irving Crystal and the first wave neoconservatives, the original neoconservatives, had been New Deal Democrats. They supported the New Deal. They continued to support the New Deal throughout their lives. Social Security. They supported Medicare throughout their lives. Among the rest of the right, among the conservatives who had been there with Buckley, say, in the 1950s, this was extremely controversial. In the, in the opening editorial of National Review, 1955, it says, it's a good question whether you can be a conservative and support the New Deal, right? Irving Kristol and the original neoconservatives supported the New Deal. What is a welfare state? Well, Irving Kristol's version of the welfare state would have supplied basic goods such as uh, unemployment insurance, health care, pensions, right? Things that basically every democracy has, you know, uh, but, uh, and that it's foolish to think we'd get, we'd get rid of, right? As some conservatives want to do. But he would do it in the mains that are the most uh, uh, economically free as possible, right? To cut down on uh, uh, on bureaucracy. It was the bureaucracy that Irving Kristol opposed, and he distinguished between a welfare state that would provide a minimum floor for people's education, for people's health, for people's retirements, things that no advanced democracy goes without. But then the welfare state that is intrusive, the bureaucratic state, the state that tells you how to live, where to go to school what masks, whether to wear masks, right? Um, that gets into these decisions that really should be reserved to the sphere of private decision-making. That welfare state, Irving Kristol opposed. So for the conservative welfare state, it's the conservative welfare state is the state that's going to provide these basic goods. And in fact, I went back and was reading one of his speeches in defense of the conservative welfare state where he talks about, say, the child tax credit. And he says the child tax credit should be enlarged. And he gave a figure. I don't know that remember the exact numbers at the moment, but I will just say that I put the figure he gave in 1993, I believe, into the inflation calculator and wanted to see how much that child tax credit would be worth in 2022. And it was a lot of money. He was willing to spend big. And that would be controversial. But it was the child tax credit, right? It, was, it wasn't necessarily something that would involve creating a new government department. And so when I look at some of the proposals now that are circulate on today's new right, I'm wondering what conservative welfare state are they advocating for? Are they saying the conservative welfare state that is going to provide public goods that, that are basically legitimized, very few voter, voters oppose, and are they going to do that in the way that is the most economically efficient and maximizes individual choice and competition? Or do they want a welfare state that is top down and intrusive? And Irving Kristol did not like that welfare state. Um, so that's kind of one, one uh, distinction uh, I would make. One, one last point, though. Irving Kristol always said that the mistake many libertarians make is assuming that economics is more important than politics. And he said that's wrong. 
politics is always more important than economics. And so in some of the conversations we're having today about America's relationship to China, I think he would say that we cannot allow the business community or economic theory to determine the nature of that relationship. Politics matters more, right? And so on some of the arguments, like say those that Tom Cotton was making about strategic decoupling, I think the first wave neoconservatives would be open to those. How do we ensure that our, we are not economically dependent on China? And also, how do we ensure that China does not steal our intellectual property, our technology? And, and, with, and with reference to the, the Cold War, the first Cold War against the Soviet Union, where we had nothing like the economic relationships that we have with China today. So that would be an area where he, I think he would be more sympathetic with the new right when they make that argument. But as soon as the new right gets into top-down bureaucracy, I think he would be very, very leery of putting hands in unelected figures, whether they say they're conservatives or whether they're liberals. Matt, we're, we're about out of time, but want to wrap up with one last question that we ask all of our guests. What is conservatism? American conservatism is to the defense of the American idea of liberty and the political and social institutions that incarnate and sustain that idea. The Constitution, the family, the local government, local school, religious faith, voluntary association, and the market, which has always been around America, uh, around in America. We're, we're not European. We have to make that distinction between American conservatism and other forms. The adjective does a lot of work. And American conservatism, like America itself, is unique. And what's unique about it is our free political institutions and our traditions of civil, political, and religious liberty. And that is what American conservatives must defend. Thanks so much for joining us today, Matt. If people are interested in seeing more of your work or following you, where can they find you? A lot of places. And the best place maybe is to go to my scholar page at AEI.org, but you can also find me at Twitter. I'm just at Continetti, C-O-N-T-I-N-E-T-T-I. And then, of course, I write for the Washington Free Beacon, National Review, Commentary Magazine. And then, uh, two, just to put in another plug, my book, The Right, the 100-Year War for American Conservatism is available for pre-order and will be released on April 19th. Yes, the manuscript is uh, sitting on my desk right now. So it's- uh, Study it hard, for, Nate. I'm excited, yeah. Study it um, hard. All right, well, thanks again, Matt. It was a lot of fun. And thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, select modern age articles, ISI books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.